today we have Cami Russo, who is the founder of Defiant Media, moderating a fantastic panel of DeFi leaders. I'll let Cami introduce the rest of our panel, but I do want to remind everyone that this is a live discussion, so we'll be taking questions throughout the session. Uh, Cami will be setting uh, some, some time aside throughout to monitor Q&A. So feel free to write in using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. We can keep this as, as interactive as possible. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. I will now turn things over to Cami to kick off our discussion. Thanks so much, Elisa. Um, and thank you so much, Crypto Compare, for inviting me and us uh, to, to this panel. Um, welcome, everyone. Should be should be a good one. And what an awesome discussion we just heard uh, with with Sam. Really interesting stuff, and we we should touch on um, on some of that coming up. So um, I will introduce uh, our, our panelists. Uh, we have uh, Emilio Frangela from uh, Ave. He's protocol lead. Uh, Ave is a DeFi lending protocol. Um, Lex Sokolin, uh, global fintech co-head at Consensus. Uh, Consensus is a venture studio for Ethereum-based um, startups. Uh, Jeremy Mushigi, I hope I'm not um, butchering your name, Jeremy, uh, head of growth at Balancer Labs, um, a DeFi portfolio manager and decentralized exchange. Um, Jeremy was just uh, chatting that he's having some connection issues. So hopefully, he he'll be able to stay on, but we might see, see him drop off. So don't don't get scared. <laughs> um, and then uh, Ryan Breen, uh, founder and CEO of Alchemy, which built infrastructure to connect uh, CFI to DeFi. So um, welcome everyone. Um, so I, I, I want to start, the, the topic of this panel is uh, DeFi in 2021, where we are and what's next. So um, DeFi is obviously this uh, ecosystem of financial applications built on blockchain technology that is on its way, I would say, or at least very much trying to replace uh, the traditional financial system and fintech as we know it. Um, but the reality is that 99% of the world uh, now uh, today is, is using fintech applications and the traditional financial firms to deal with their money and financial needs. Um, but we all kind of have this sense that fintech is kind of stuck, uh, that it hasn't really innovated much in the past, I don't know, couple of decades even. Um, and so I, I wanted to start with this uh, great quote by, by Lex. Um, he said, uh, mobile new banks and robot advisors have been putting scotch tape on traditional securities for a while, layering beautiful pie charts and price lines on your phone screen, but this is like Spotify selling physical records or Netflix mailing, mailing you video cassettes. What comes next is broad-based distribution of regular financial use cases powered by computational blockchain rails. So literally every, every everyone into their phones, like blockchain into uh, people's phones. So um, I wanted to get kind of your, your thoughts uh, on this. Is, is this true? Uh, like, it, 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 has there actually been no innovation in, in fintech um, right now? Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? Like, what's, if we can start kind of from the old guard to the new guard, what is fintech do, doing right now? And, and maybe, like, since, since this is your code, maybe you can start and kind of expand on that. Absolutely, and uh, thank you so much for for <laughs> both using that as the prompt and uh, to uh, to crypto compare for having all of us here. Um, I've um, I've used this frame uh, a bit in the past, so apologies to anybody who's who's heard me uh, position it. But I think it's you know in in all cases it's definitely rhetoric. It's it's a rhetorical frame. Um, so it, it won't be 100% accurate, but it is in its spirit accurate. And I think um, I, I share Sam's view on having a big target, you know, and I think if you look at the financial services industry, that's a 20% of GDP target, uh, you know, so I, I think we can, we can go from five to 20. 
And then within that um, industry, there are manufacturers, there are people that make stuff, and then there are distributors, there are people that sell stuff. And so uh, large institutional capital markets or depository banks or underwriters of loans or insurance companies, the, the organizations that take in money and capital and do some sort of risk transformation to it, those are the factories of the stuff. And then there's lots of distributors, there's lots of people who sell it. And in the past, the selling of the stuff was done by financial advisors and people in bank branches, right? You, to, to go get a loan, you go into a bank branch to talk to a human being uh, in the year uh, 5000 BC or something like that. Uh, and that has been the target of most fintech transformation. Not all of it. There's a lot of fintech that's doing business process optimization and you know, automating decision making and blah, blah, blah. But those companies tend to be $100 million, $500 million companies. If you look at the really chunky fintech stuff, and we now have many examples, you know, we have the um, 40 billion Robinhood IPO with, um, with a billion of revenue. We have the Revolut numbers with 300 million of revenue and 15 million users. We've got the Chime numbers. Um, we have every single SPAC under the sun uh, uh, from, from eToro to Dave to Money Lion. And so we see how that sausage is made. And the way that the sausage is made is a beautiful experience, uh, that thing that we need to build as, as DeFi products, and then API connectivity into tr traditional banking and investment services. And so I think that's fantastic in getting people used to living their financial lives digitally on their phone, in, in communities, in conversations, in um, uh, driven by you know, meme investing or, or driven by uh, trying to get your paycheck earlier. All this stuff is fantastic, but it, it all anchors into, um, I can give you 10 companies which intermediate all financial technology, you know, the core banking platforms of um, FIS, Jack Henry, and so on, the institutional capital markets platforms of the stock exchanges um, uh, for, for investment and wealth management, the custodian platforms and portfolio management platforms that underpin um, most, uh, most asset management. And you know, this is the glue that blockchain just takes out. Uh, and especially programmable blockchain, because it it, gen it makes generic the the software, meaning you can run you can write software for any asset class. Anyway, I'm kind of getting long in the tooth here, but the you know the the main point is that fintech is already sitting there today with 50 to 100 million users of people who are not uh, necessarily crypto users, and. It's not necessarily, uh, it's not just flipping on the button to connect to DeFi, but it's right there. It's already API first and it's already available. And so, you know, I think for, for me, one of the largest levers we're gonna see is um, for, the, for, the, for the FinTech apps to, to really distribute uh, DeFi product. Um, and that's gonna be the kind of the next leg of expansion for our, for, for our industry. Super interesting, right? You're saying that most of the innovation happening in fintech right now is kind of on the consumer facing side of things, like how, how to distribute these uh, financial services to users. So th they've all developed th these like beautiful experiences, but in the end, kind of the railing behind uh, these experiences has remained the same for many, many years. Um, and that's exactly what uh, DeFi is, is rebuilding. So now kind of the next step is how to connect those two sides. And I think Ryan, uh, you're especially well positioned to, to talk about this. So uh, what's, what's next here? Like what's, what's missing for these two sides to communicate uh, better? Yeah, um, I think it really, it comes down to, you know, there are um, some kind of compliance requirements um, on the traditional FinTech side. And um, that don't really, there, there's not an interface on the DeFi side to um, really kind of um, meet those requirements, uh, meaning like uh, KYC checks, AML checks, stuff that, um, you know, financial institutions and, and businesses require um, to operate on. Um, so I, I think for, uh, you know, for us to uh, be able to kind of advance and, and be able to kind of connect these two worlds that 
uh, standards uh, and bridges are going to have to be developed to allow for the kind of open API connectivity, API first connectivity to actually be able to tap into uh, DeFi that um, satisfies these kind of regulatory um, requirements and, and uh, you know, restraints that, that the, uh, the businesses need. Mm. Um, so uh, Jeremy or, or Emilio from kind of the DeFi builders side of things, um, do you think uh, this this will be the way to connect uh, with with fintech uh, like a, a more um, like regulation friendly uh, side of DeFi like uh, doing KYC um, like I don't know like checking all those all those boxes that regulators would want to see before bringing this stuff to to the mainstream? Uh, do you agree with that or does? DeFi maybe live on a separate um, ecosystem and, and just like FinTech is on, on, on its kind of one side and DeFi just like goes and does like its own thing um, in, in kind of this parallel uh, ecosystem. Um, it, yeah, curious to know your, your thoughts, whoever wants to go first. Jeremy, do you want to, to go first? No, go ahead. Yeah, uh, okay, so Let's start with the, uh, the idea that, of course, uh, as Ryan was saying before, like there are some specific requirements that fintech company, companies have to actually be able to interact with financial systems, right? So anti-money laundering, um, KYC, then uh, validations are pretty mandatory for them, uh, which essentially it's quite, um, if, you, if you will, quite a big uh, roadblock right now for institutions and fintech to actually enter the, 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 the DeFi space. At the same time, what I believe is, I think that at the end of the day, like the, the union between the fintech space and DeFi space will actually happen somewhere in the middle. You know, I think like the DeFi space requires new um, uh, forms of regulation that, that that like the current form of regulations that are applied to uh, classic fintech and to the railways, if you will, of, of finance, as we know right now, they are not completely or fully applicable uh, to DeFi protocols. So I, I at least I hope that at some point, like the uh, connection between the um, classical financial world and fintech companies on top and actually what we are building on DeFi will be somewhere in the middle where uh, DeFi some, somehow acknowledges that there is this other aspect of finance that cannot like uh, actually interact with DeFi protocols as, as they are uh, working right now and at the same time uh, re regulations and like uh, the old financial system recogn recognizes these very powerful um, primitives that we are building that cannot most likely be um, classified under the conventional uh, regu uh, re regulatory framework that there is right now. This is mm. what I hope and I think we will see in the future. So you think regulators will have to adapt uh, to DeFi um, and maybe a new framework will emerge as you think uh, DeFi doesn't really fit into the current uh, structures? That, that, that's my hope. Like that, That's my mm -hmm. hope. If, if we can achieve a point where a, a regulation is actually able to um, cover the, uh, the DeFi uh, without actually uh, kind of um, giving away all the innovation that DeFi is bringing and that will bring in the future, then that is the, the best I think we can hope for. Got it. What do you think, Jeremy? Yes, yeah, so I agree with what Emilio is saying. And I would add that I think from the DeFi builders perspective, probably, I mean, there are a few driving forces, but, but a, a one very large one is wanting to respond to market demand. There are uh, you know, large institutional players that can 
you know, make a very large impact in the uh, total growth or liquidity of a DeFi protocol. And in order for them to participate, there are regulatory hurdles that uh, need to be resolved. So um, I don't think that, I think that teams in the space are seeing those opportunities and, um, you know, they don't want to ignore those. So you might see like more and more protocols that are kind of building out some like regulated version of their platform uh, so that they can like participate in that market. Um, and I think in general, like as regulations continue to, or as they become more clear and as they are like more uh, explicit, then um, DeFi teams will have more of an understanding of like what they need to do in order to keep their business sustainable and to keep the thing growing. Uh, so uncertainty is a big factor, but I think when you have two sides that really want to get together, they'll find a way. And I think they are finding a way. You have the um, FinTech and institutional side that wants to uh, be more involved in DeFi. They see the benefits, they see the, the efficiency, they see the yields, and um, they don't wanna leave that on the table. And on the other side, you have DeFi protocols seeing that there's a lot of capital and a lot of resources that are wanting to enter the space and they don't wanna leave that on the table either. Yeah, there's there's this need of making the, the two worlds meet, but it's like, they're not talking in the same language yet, um, both like technologically and also on the regulatory side. Um, and Ryan was um, uh, raising a great point in like in, in internally, which uh, I I'll remind uh, participants to yeah please um, drop your questions in the Q and A. Um, so what Ryan was asking is um, about uh, kind of uh, regulatory Legos, uh, like compliant composability. Um, you know, like DeFi works on these money Legos uh, because it's built on open source and like all these different protocols uh, plug into each other. Maybe, do you guys think there, there's a way of uh, having um, like different uh, regulatory sectors? Like maybe there, there, there can be uh, like a completely open, uh, non-regulated side of DeFi and then the, there, there's um, like a separate side of it that's like more regulated, a, sec uh, a third side of it that's like more uh, for institutions or, or maybe it's like fragmented um, according to like geographies. Um, I'm not exactly sure how, how that would look or, or that would work or if that like goes against kind of the very, very idea of DeFi in the first place. Like I, I, I think what's cool about this is it's that anyone can access it. So I don't know if like we want to have these like silos again. Um, but it's, yeah, it's an interesting question. What, what do you guys think? I think we're gonna, we're gonna look at this moment, uh, as like such a wonderful utopian moment. And we're going to be mm -hmm. super wistful about how we all felt now. Um, and DeFi will be everywhere and boring and integrated and, you know, not novel, uh, at, at some point, but I think for, for those that remember where we are, we're, we're going to um, potentially re regret uh, letting go of some of the uh, kind of the ideals that the space started from. And, you know, there, there's nothing you can do is just sort of reality hitting, um, hitting the world. But I'm reminded of, you know, people who were involved in the early internet um, who wrote a lot of utopian thinking in the, in the 80s and 90s uh, before the 2000s brought, you know, Google login and Facebook login all over the web to create these gates. Um, and I feel like there's a pretty good chance we're gonna be seeing gates um, as part of the negotiation between sovereign nations and, you know, what regulators have to do in order to, uh, to, to do consumer protection and so on, uh, but that it, that it will create the splintering and the splintering is familiar to us. Like we've seen it. We, I mean, for, for those of you that do remember that kind of the, the, the wall gardens pop up, I feel like that's, um, that feels like what the, the, the potential downside of, um, of what could happen could be like that. But I, I think as long as we come back to the ideals that people are expressing now um, and that, 
the the distinctions and sort of the gates that are being created are, are really arbitrary. Uh, they're they're about power. They're about uh, society. They're not about technology. I, as long as some portion of that thread survives, I feel like there's um, there's a chance that it will overcome in the end. Yeah, we'll see what um, what happens. But yeah, I think I think if if we are taking kind of the very early shoots, uh, like and maybe uh, Emilia, you, you can talk about this, but like Aves um, Pro uh, product for for institutions. Um, uh, I know there's like uh, others in in the works that are similar to the to this, like a more like. Um, KYC version of, of different uh, protocols, we're already starting to see versions of this, of, of like a more segmented um, DeFi. Uh, yeah, Emily, do, do, you, do you have yeah, thoughts I, on that? Like you say, Camila, unfortunately, I cannot, I cannot yet really talk about that. Mm -hmm. what, what I can talk about is that like um, this product that everyone almost knows that is coming uh, essentially is like the result of months of research in uh, mostly not really on the technical side, but more more on on the compliance and like how essentially how to make things uh, work, uh, which was pretty pretty interesting because like to me as a builder it gave like a different perspective, like more insights on how the actual um, institutional uh, world actually works. And uh, what I can say is that, that in my opinion, the interesting part uh, 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 regarding uh, the product when it will be launched will be what the role of the other governance will be. Because even though as almost everyone knows, everyone that follows Ave knows like the product will be more oriented towards a certain category of users that have, have certain requirements in terms of um, participation. Uh, the other governance will still have a quite important role, which I think is still pretty, pretty, very, very cool. It's probably the first of its kind experiment in the in this uh, field, and I'm really curious of, mm, to see how it will play out in the next months. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, the, uh, how how is Balancer planning on integrating with? Um, either with with a fintech or or uh, doing something similar to what Ave is doing, and maybe building products that are specific to institutions. Yeah, so far, um, you know, institutional players have been um, building on Balancer, using Balancer to build like structured investment products such as index funds, um, and letting letting Balancer act as you know, the DeFi backend, um, you know, the mullet, the, the DeFi on the mm -hmm. back and the CeFi on the front kind of model. Um, there are certainly more, you know, organizations that would like to be using balancers functionality, but um, are kind of handcuffed because of, of compliance uh, issues. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of an ongoing, uh, question that um you know we will look to answer so i, I don't have like a specific uh you mm -hmm. know plan to share with you at this point got it okay um i wanted to share um a question that came in um in in the audience so um there's there's an audience member who is a uh a blockchain a securities lawyer and the he says, I don't think DeFi lives on a separate legal system. Um, where exactly is the separate legal system? Um, and it, yeah, like what, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's a valid question because um, you, we, we are kind of in this space, like assuming that you're you know, interacting with, with wallets and uh, like non-custodial wallets without giving out information. And I think there's there's this um, assumption uh, by DeFi builders and and users that it's all good, like as long as kind of everything is non custodial and you know uh, app protocols aren't using um, uh, uh, aren't uh, 
handling user user funds. Um, but yeah, like where where is it that kind of regulation and and De- DeFi uh, touch like? Is it is it fair to assume that it's like a separate um, legal system? Um, I, think, I don't know, like maybe or yeah or Ryan. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's tricky. I mean I, I wouldn't necessarily say it's like a, a separate legal system necessarily, but it, it's kind of like a different world because you know in DeFi you have decentralized government governance and, and DAOs. And, you know, from a legal perspective or just looking at like enforcement of these things, when you don't have uh, a central custodian or a company necessarily at the center of it all, once it's kind of launched and fully decentralized, how, how can you, you know, uh, give sanctions or, or enforce different things if, uh, you know, the current legal systems that we have now, they, I, I mean, how do you, how, did, how do they seize funds? How do they stop it? Who, who do they go after? Um, so that I think that creates um, a, a kind of big challenge, um, and, and that's where I'd say is maybe they're kind of they're just in two. It's two different worlds, right? Um, so I, I think that's the biggest challenge in the space right now. I'll hop in with an attempt uh, at something of a rhetorical answer because we're you know we're all so serious and this is a DeFi conversation. Um, like everyone's got their real faces on. Nobody uh, nobody's pixelated or anything. Yeah. You know, so the the first point is like trying to really understand uh, where that question is coming from, um, and I think there is there's this presumption still, and it's a real it's a real bummer that this presumption is there, which is that some sort of uh, that that the activity happening in DeFi is in some sense more criminal or less kosher or however you want to put it, or the activity in crypto is in, in some way. Uh, less uh, less high quality than the types of financial activity that happens generally between human beings. And I think there's no evidence of this claim. Like this is pe- this is things that people have hallucinated because they think the kids are crazy and you know, get off my lawn. Um, but it's it's the evidence is not there. and and if you want really data backed uh, version of this, take a look at the research put out by Chainalysis and Cyphertrace and other companies that literally scan the, uh, um, the the blockchain data record and and understand transaction flows and understand that uh, you you can actually account for what kind of money goes where and so on and on average the illicit activity on chain is no no worse than in the traditional world and by the way uh, Deutsche Bank and Capital One are for sure way way better at facilitating money laundering than Bitcoin so just kind of want to lay that uh, that that first brick down I'd say the second point is. If you if you give the argument that um, you do want um, you do want global transactions, you do want to enable people from all over the world uh, to access financial services in new ways, you know. And for consensus, we've got MetaMask, which now has eight million monthly average users, and we see the footprint of where people are trading and where people are saving. And it's it's literally every single country in the world uh, that that people are using these services, and so, you know, you're starting from a point where the question is, well, in what jurisdiction, who does what? You know, like um, if you're an American lawyer, you might be concerned about securities trading. Uh, initiated by American citizens or offerings of securities to American citizens from some un, you know, unlicensed jurisdiction or unlicensed firm with unregistered securities. And that might be a narrow question you ask, but in the same way that you know, the Chinese government has no business, um, let's say, censoring the consumption of American media, um, Similarly, the American government has no business censoring financial services in Africa or in some parts of Asia. And so I think it becomes this really complicated jigsaw puzzle. Um, and it is anchored in the jurisdictions of where people are, are doing business, but they're doing business in ways that have, um, as was said previously, like is very novel and never done before at this with this flow at this rate, with the speed, with this kind of geographic um, distribution. And so I'll end with uh, just a reminder that in the mid 2000s, when um, uh, Napster came out, the music industry sued a whole bunch of teenagers and tried to put them in jail for 
uh, sharing MP3s. And, you know, in history's eye, that's not a great look for the record labels and, and they deserved in large part what they got um, as a, uh, an emotional response from the population. And I think we're in the same place right now. Of course, the stakes are, you know, a thousand times larger, but um, it, we, we do have prior examples of what can happen. I mean, it's such an interesting discussion because, um, you know, the question there is, is money different from information? Um, and what we're seeing here is that for the first time, um, money is being transacted in a way that's native to the internet, in, in the way that information has been um, you know, for the, since, I don't know, the 1990s, I guess. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been to me just like mind blowing to see this evolution of, uh, the internet of value. Um, and when you're using DeFi, you really get this sense of this is how money is supposed to work on the internet. Um, and so that, that kind of, uh, you know, parallel with, uh, with Napster and, and music is, um, I think really makes sense uh, because, right, like we, we already uh, have gone through that um, evolution for information, for, for music, uh, for movies, um, for, uh, I don't know, uh, digital images or uh, uh, social media. Um, so that, that's kind of like, that's already being shared freely and freely and globally. And so what we're seeing now is what 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 happens when the same um, when this when developers are trying to do the same thing with money? Um, do you guys think it's it's fair uh, for money to get a, a a different or like or a, a, the same treatment than than information? I mean, should should there be kind of different um, laws in in place? I mean, philosophically, no. Difference? Yeah. Philosophically, no, but it's, it's treated differently in practice because the stakes are higher and there's more to lose by entrenched mm -hmm. industries that are, you know, very, very um, powerful and profitable. So I think there's just, uh, it's, it's more disruptive when it comes to money and it, and it has more implications, um, not only on like a business level, but on a political level, um, and on like a macroeconomic level. Mm. Yeah, like so it's the, treated it's treated different. I mean, but should it be like, uh, Ryan, what, what, no. are, what are your no, thoughts? No, why should here? it be? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure on that one. <laughs> I'm kind of just watching <laughs> and speculating. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, what do you like, Emilio? What do you think would be the impact? And, and I'm taking these uh, questions from the Q and A as well. Um, the impact to DeFi if something like the the um, the travel rule in 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 the U.S. So like the the um, requirement for um, for uh, applications to uh, to disclose or or to I, I guess it's to gather information about their their users. Um, what would that, that do to DeFi? Is it feasible to, to have DeFi in a world where uh, th that is a requirement? Ah, you're muted. Emilio, you're, you're muted? Yes, sorry, sorry guys. <laughs> it's okay. Yes, yeah, I, it is a very hard question. I mean, it's a, one of the questions that is probably more, um, recurring, you know, on, on the crypto Twitter and everywhere, like it, you know, people talk about cryptocurrencies and DeFi, like would it, uh, DeFi really work if there would be this kind of enforcements? So first of all, the first thing is like, this is one of the reasons why before I was saying that DeFi it like probably needs a new kind, a new kind of uh, a different approach from uh, compliance and legal perspective compared to traditional finance and, and fintech. Like, how do you enforce these kind of things on a decentralized protocol? How do you enforce these things on Uniswap? Where, uh, okay, it's true there is Uniswap uh, labs, but Uniswap labs, like, 
uh, Uniswap kind of in, inherits the same censorship resistance of Ethereum, right? Like Uniswap is immutable. There are no uh, controls anywhere on whatever is deployed on chain. Uh, the, the front end is out there. You can host your front end on your computer. Like there is no uh, way of forbidding you that. Uh, anyone can run a Uniswap uh, front end. So the official one is not really needed like to, to trade on Uniswap. So how do you enforce anything on a Uniswap? So mm -hmm. I think like if the protocol is uh, truly uh, decentralized in all the different aspects, then I don't think this can happen unless like a global ban on cryptocurrencies or whatever other that uh, honestly, I believe it's mm. quite, quite unlikely, un unlikely, but, uh, you know, I guess we will need to leave and see uh, what, what will happen. I hope that this is why I was saying before, I, I hope that actually uh, the other side, this traditional finance and, and, fintech will see the potential in making finance actually more uh, open and more uh, accessible to everyone by uh, using DeFi and blockchain and Ethereum. Therefore, uh, kind of trying, uh, right now they are scared, if you will, right? They are scared, they don't understand, they don't really don't understand um, what's going on. So of course, like usually humans, when they are scared, they are they try to run away from what's happening right so i think it's also as builders as pioneers of the space is also our responsibility to try to 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 bring this forward from a different perspective that will hopefully like bring different rules to actually apply to DeFi rather than enforcing trying to enforce something on something that cannot be on which cannot be enforced like in the case of uniswap for example yeah. Mm. I think it's a great point because like one thing is what uh, what regulators would want to see and the, the other thing is what regulators can actually enforce and yeah right now DeFi is moving or at least uh, you see it in in every kind of protocols uh, or projects roadmap that the ultimate goal is uh, full decentralization so being run by um, a DAO being uh, governance being decided on token holders. Uh, there's no headquarter. There, there's no kind of uh, corporate organization. So nobody you can go after. Uh, user funds aren't are in custody. So it's 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 uh, it becomes harder to um, harder to regulate. Um, okay, so switching uh, gears a, a little bit because. Um, the um, where these protocols are, are built is also a, a key uh, part on uh, on how decentralized they can be right and so so far DeFi has effectively been built on on ethereum um i'm, I'm not sure uh, uh tvl on ethereum versus uh binance smart chain or solana or like other chains uh, that have also attracted tvl but um most of value is, is still on, on Ethereum. Um, wh why do you think uh, it's Ethereum has been hard to, to replace? And do you think that will be the case going forward? I mean, it's it's still obviously, you know, like I said, Ethereum is still kind of the place where, where DeFi is being built, but that kind of supremacy, if you, if you can call it that, has already been eroded uh, pretty quickly this year. Uh, so what does the space look like uh, going forward? Uh, Multi-chain uh, DeFi uh, or one chain to rule, rule them all? Like how, how does uh, this look like? Uh, me personally, I believe like that Ethereum has and will retain um, the, the leadership on uh, like on uh, mostly on the on the DeFi space, but essentially on on everything. Like we have seen actually other uh, solution like starting to pick up kind of um, on volume. For example, Tezos regarding mm -hmm. NFTs. Um, uh, but I still think that Ethereum has the most the strongest uh, foundations in terms of 
um, decentralization and censorship uh, resistance. Uh, those foundations will actually be way stronger once we have uh, the merge and proof of, of stake. I personally believe that proof of stake is way more censorship resistant than uh, proof of work. We have been seeing with uh, Bitcoin, like that the China uh, Chinese government, they actually had the uh, ability to actually pinpoint uh, the all the different uh, large scale miners that were in China. They had to relocate somewhere else, which of course, this shows how proof of work especially with um, ASIC hardware, then it becomes like way easier to censor compared to something uh, like where you don't uh, even proof of work without uh, uh, ASIC resistant proof of work and or, or proof of stake like it would be Ethereum in the future. Of course, there are a whole set of arguments against this, uh, this reasoning like the concentration of uh, capital in the hands of the um, like the wealthy wealthy become wealthier and stuff. But on overall, I believe that the the in terms of decentralization and censorship resistance and also environment environmental impact and everything that we have been seeing in these months, like the the um, uh, the migration to proof of stake will actually mark the, the, the final lead of Ethereum on all the different uh, blockchains. And then we have like rollups uh, to scale, to be able to actually, to be able to actually uh, onboard the next millions of users, which is still a very infant technology, but it's very promising. Uh, if you guys have been trying um, optimism. I, I have been personally working on Arbitrum and it's amazing like to, uh, I can give a quick comparison that deploying the other protocol on Ethereum with the current gas prices cost are, uh, costs around $2,000 and on Arbitrum I spent like uh, less than $50. So like the mm. The, the ratio uh, cost, uh, cost opportunity ratio and also the performance of the network, the ability to onboard more users will become way uh, better in the, in, the, in the next future. So, but this, uh, that, this doesn't mean that like, I think uh, like we have been seeing side chains like Polygon, Ave was one of the pioneers of uh, onboarding users. Like when there was the crazy gas prices of some months ago, like, and a lot of uh, community members were complaining about like the inability to use the protocol anymore because like a simple deposit transaction or even worse withdrawal transactions for users that maybe they deposited like small amount uh, of stable coins and they weren't able to actually take that amount back because of the high transaction fees. Mm -hmm. Then Abe pioneered that migration to, to, to Polygon that went really well and the, the protocol acquired a lot of new users actually coming from mostly from other chains, like for example, uh, Binance Smart Chain and stuff. And that was really interesting. And that also helped the, the other community like to understand how to handle like high, high like performance network. Like it was a nice uh, testing ground for what is yet to come like uh, rollups and, and other scaling solutions. So I still believe that although Ethereum will be dominant in, in, in this space in this space for the foreseeable future, there will be for sure other chains that will will actually work um, together with Ethereum to actually uh, make the user experience even better and even easier uh, in the future. Yeah. Interesting that um, an Ethereum scaling solution was able to take uh, users away from other um, layer ones. I, I I didn't know that. So what do the um, others think? Like, do you guys think proof of stake plus um, rollups plus other scaling solutions on, on Ethereum um, will kind of be the final death blow to Ethereum killers or, <laughs> or no? I think that Ethereum network effects are very hard to overcome. Uh, and I think that it's, it's just this compounding effect where uh, as each um, developer chooses to build on Ethereum, they make it more attractive for the next developer to also build on Ethereum. So that's why Ethereum has uh, you know, become so dominant and has built such a strong moat. Um, and it's hard to see another chain actually you know, 
totally like usurping uh, Ethereum in its in its role. But I, I agree with Emilio with the idea that um, other chains will serve complementary purposes and perhaps uh, help you know, take on some certain types of computation that are not feasible on Ethereum. Um, and, you know, maybe like a better way to uh, handle that computation could be like on another blockchain that uh, maybe is not as decentralized as, as Ethereum, but is not like a fully off-chain um, computation either. Um, Lex and Ryan, any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I think um, there's a, a, a lot of great sort of builder information uh that's that's been shared uh you know from from our side at consensus you know there, there's uh -oh. <laughs> i've got guests uh, <laughs> i'll i'll pass the baton i'll be back in one minute sure yeah so um yeah i i generally agree with um you know what uh jeremy and, and emilio were saying that you know a theory you know it's ethereum definitely has the the builders in the community and i think you know, they're, they're, they're still best positioned to, um, you know, continue to kind of lead in, in the space. And I think, you know, just another aspect too, it's um, a lot of the growth on, on kind of some of the other competitors or Ethereum killers that, are, that have come out, so to speak, has I think largely been based to, um, you know, high gas fees. And so if, uh, if the proof of stake launch on Ethereum, um, you know, successfully lowers those gas fees, um, what kind of other offerings are, are some of these other Ethereum killers, so to speak? You know, what 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 are the other advantages? That being said, as well, I, I also kind of um, I know for me personally, it's about I don't think it has to be a one chain to kind of rule them all. I, I think it's all about uh, in the space, you know, building on ramps to allow everyone to participate. So you know, even just back to um, kind of compliance and, and the future of DeFi, if there are chains that maybe address some of the compliance or regulatory issues as, as we kind of solve those and, and that can integrate as well and we can find a way to bridge that into um, Ethereum or, or other protocols, I, I very much think there's a, a place in the ecosystem for them to play and uh, you know, to continue to um, bring more people into DeFi. Sorry for hopping off before. There was a, a, a four-year-old that had a very important thing that had to be addressed. Um, <laughs> you know, so to give a slightly qualitatively different answer, um, you know, for the an effort to plug in, um, you know, something like Polygon or um, other layer twos into MetaMask. Uh, it was really important for that ecosystem to be used by millions of people. Um, you know, and similarly, one of the things that really benefited BSC, I think, is the fact that um, you've got this huge built-in audience uh, inside of a crypto wallet that can just hop on and use an EVM-based financial services ecosystem. And I think there's more, oh, and that's the tip of the spear. There's dozens of things like that. So for example, node infrastructure, um, you know, to uh, like in, Infura had um, uh, plugged in Polygon as well. And for developers to build uh, software on Polygon, if they want to use, they don't want to spin up their own node, but want help with that. And they can API into a third party and, and get their apps up and running, you know, and, and then there are lots of third party services doing that as well. And then you get to developer libraries, whether that's hard hat or truffle or others to, to get going on these things. And so the, the network effect is, is really quite, yes, there's the, the technical bits and the standards and, Web3 being kind of EVM uh, compatible and all that stuff and what a token is. And I think that's really hard to break out of because that's already already there. But then the, you know, where people are and pulling them out and creating new behaviors is really, really hard. Um, and so, you know, the world that I hope we see is for Ethereum or whatever version thereof to be kind of the core trust layer, the foundation. And then it's going to be a multi-chain world that things plug into, but, you know, some chains are going to be uh, larger and more performant and doing, uh, let's say, more um, 
work that requires more decentralization. And then there are going to be chains that are more performant because they can do computation faster or they can, you know, they can they can handle file storage in some particular way or whatnot. Um, but it's not sort of uh, uh, the, the outcome I think is going to have power laws and the power laws today point to, um, to Ethereum. Uh, so a pretty wide consensus here about Ethereum uh, dominating and, and maybe other chains um, having a more specialized role on, on certain functions within th this kind of broader financial ecosystem. Um, we are okay getting to the final 10 minutes of, of the panel and I feel like we need to address uh, the crypto market. Um, it's been kind of on a downturn. Today is another red day. So what would a, if we are a kind of at the start of a new uh, bear market in crypto, how does that affect DeFi at all? Um, I think, you know, to me, um, one, um, one advantage that DeFi has over kind of the rest of crypto is that it actually provides um, other use cases uh, besides speculating on number go up, you know, you can uh, deposit stable coins and start earning interest. You can have like more um, uh, passive strategies. You can invest on a, a basket of tokens on, on balancer. Um, and so to me, that, that, that seems like uh, an advantage and, and that maybe DeFi weathers the uh, kind of weather a bear market a, a bit better than crypto has in, in the past. Um, but I mean, curious to you know uh, your thoughts. Like first, are we uh, headed to, uh, to the crypto winter? Um, and if so, how, how does uh, DeFi fare? Ryan, I'll pick Yeah, I'll, all right, all right, I'll give it a go. Um, yeah, so I mean, a couple of thoughts there. Like, I guess first, I, just like looking at the last year, I mean, especially in DeFi sector, we're up like 2000% in total value locks. So it, it's very hard for me and just thinking of that metric in mind and just how much incredible growth and innovation we've had in the space that, you know, that, that we're actually entering into a bear market. Um, I, I think, you know, a, another thing is really, uh, and you kind of mentioned this, volatility is kind of good for um, the space as well and, and some of these different products. And it's because in DeFi you, you have, it's not just people speculating on price or you actually have people that are lending and that creates a certain behavior when the price goes up or down or the interest rates go up and down. So it can create a lot of transactions and, and really, um, you know, some of the use cases for um, the tools uh, that people have built on these protocols can, can really use and be shine now. And I guess kind of my last thought on it is, you know, we're kind of entering into like the later part of summer. Um, some of the restrictions around the globe with, you know, travel bans and different things are kind of freeing up and, you know, people are a bit in like ready for vacation mode. And so to kind of see the markets, uh, you know, taper off around this time of year every year is, is kind of like a normal thing. Um, so I, I, I'd like to be optimistic and think that, you know, we're going to see um, a lot more movements and the, the markets kind of rebound um, towards the end of summer here. But um, either way, I, I think overall that uh, we've been having a, a great run for this past year. Um, Jeremy? Um, I've, I've always been, a, I've always held a long-term outlook on uh, crypto and DeFi. Um, I try not to get caught up too much in the short-term cycles. And um, I think that <clears throat> bull and bear markets both present their own unique opportunities. You know, bull markets bring opportunities to capture a lot of growth and capture a lot of interest. And, and like, hopefully, you know, when you're a builder in the space, like have your product in a place where it's ready to receive and to accommodate that inflow, that influx. And, um, and bear markets are an opportunity to build with less distractions and um, to to you know make make real progress and and have you know a lot of focus on board. So whether it's one or the other, I think from from the perspective of a builder and from a long term investor and you know someone who's very dedicated to the space, um, whichever one it is will will be good actually. 
there's positives to to gain from each one and i can't predict what the hell the market is going to do in the short term but the good news is that uh, i don't need to i can react to it and i can you know respond in the appropriate way and and you know make the best out of it for sure um i mean yeah i'm it's it's interesting that i don't think defi has ever lived through an actual bear market like DeFi was built in a bear market. Um, I mean, if we consider kind of the start of DeFi, uh, uh, Maker uh, releasing DAI uh, end of 2017, and then uh, Ave Compound, all of that uh, was uh, built, what, 20, 2018, 2019. Um, and that was through kind of the latest bear market. So we haven't really seen um, kind of uh, this more mature version of DeFi uh, in, in a setting where, you know, prices are going down. So um, we'll definitely be interesting to see. Emilio or, or Lex, thoughts on this? Yeah, actually for me, it's pretty interesting because I joined um, Ave when it was still called Itlen in beginning, beginning of 2018. And actually uh, I always like I to, I always like to remember that because the, the uh, when I started, actually, we already had, like in 2017, uh, Itland, uh, now Ave already had a DeFi protocol. Like you could like uh, collateralize your assets on Itland, like in, even, even though it was a peer-to-peer -peer way of doing that, uh, you, you could like um, get supplied liquidity that you could use like on the, the exact same way you would use uh, Ave or Compound today. And mm -hmm. so I actually saw what was the impact on the, of the bear market on, uh, on that product, even though of course the scale of the market was completely different. Like we are talking today about tens of billions while um, back in the days, like probably the whole crypto market was not even close to that. So, uh, but it was really, uh, I, st I still believe that we call it as Ave team and me personally, I collected some information back in the days that will be useful mm -hmm. if uh, I don't consider the current one a bear market, like when we are still have Ethereum around $2,000. I don't think that this is a bear market, honestly. But if bear market really comes, I think that... Uh, like the, the current state, if something along the, the line of 2000, end of 2017, beginning of 2018 really comes, I think that the market is completely different right now. There are tools like in 2017, there were a lot of white papers and very little to, to actually show for. Uh, right now there are usable products. Uh, there, are, there is um, easy onboarding and offboarding for crypto. There are stable coins, so you don't even need actually to onboard or offboard. Things that in 2017 were not even um, yet in, in uh, production ready, you know. So I think if a real bear market comes, um, DeFi will easily easily survive. I, most likely, the, of course, like we are going to see a contraction in like probably protocol revenues, uh, TBL, whatever other metrics people like to use to uh, evaluate um, DeFi protocols. But that is inevitable when the, the price of the assets drop for, for a significant amount. But I still think that like um, the De DeFi space, although it will be impacted, it will not like uh, DeFi is not a bubble. I don't think DeFi is a bubble. DeFi is here to say and to evolve in the future. Yeah. I agree. Nice. Uh, yeah. Thank you for for. Um, uh, I feel like I have to have a big bang. I, you know, I, this is a market question. And so I think there's a secular change question, which is, will the software from DeFi take 20% of the GDP over some secular amount of time? And the answer is yes. Uh, the way we have electricity now, we're going to have decentralized programmable blockchains run most of our economic software at the end. You know, it's almost like it's not even a, to me, that's not even a controversial question anymore. That's how self-radicalized I am. Um, but then the the bear market, like 
I mean, just, just look at the chart. Uh, it's, we, we had a peak and then the thing is down, right? So mm-hmm. um, sort of, there's no point, there's no point cloaking it. And the broader context is, you know, are we in a risk on or a risk off uh, investing environment more, more generally? Uh, and that's also sideways, you know, the, the, I've, I would have said we should be risk off for a long time now, um, mm. uh, but everything keeps going up and everything keeps going up. As you have asset inflation because of the continued expansionary policy uh, in the States, both you know monetary policy as well as the fiscal policy. So you've got interest rates as low as ever, forever and ever, and you've got now another however many trillion uh, being injected mm. and you've got however many trillion being distributed. And so that flows into asset classes that people can relate to, which is why you've got YOLO Robinhood um, outcomes and you've got crypto assets uh, kind of being the the risk on asset of choice. Um, But there is a theatrical nature to that and an artifice. Um, Hmm. And so I'm just, you know, it's an uncomfortable thing to rest on. Like, to, to have the foundation of your global transformation of magical software rest on the fact that other people are making mistakes or, you know, are just, it feels very swampy. So uh, I'm pretty anxious uh, about the environment going to risk off. I think it's possible. And, and if it does, what that means is rotation out of risk assets, which are uh, equities and Bitcoin and crypto. Um, not because crypto is not fantastic and doing well, but simply because it'll be an ATM to fund uh, people's cash needs. You know, so I, th- I think everybody who is building and investing in the space should, should think about their treasuries thoughtfully and should diversify and not make the mistakes of 2017 when preparing for, for their own longevity. 100%, yep. Um, the good thing is, like as we mentioned, there there are places to diversify now in crypto, which I think were harder to to come by uh, before. Um, you know, stable coins, lending, even even if th- those interest rates uh, keep coming down, uh, as uh, there's just less money to be made in in crypto, um, you can still get some some yield on on your savings. Um, so yeah, the, the the plus side is DeFi uh, will will I, I think at least uh, will will keep growing. Uh, builders in this space uh, built it during the bear market, so they'll keep building it even if there's another bear market. I think we kind of all agree on. Um, well, we, we've come to the end of the panel. Unfortunately, I couldn't get to all the questions, but thanks everyone for for joining and and participating, and most of all, thanks to the wonderful panelists for such. Uh, an interesting discussion. And thanks again, Crypto Compare, for the uh, awesome event. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.